Okay, reasons that students self-injure. And this, these are things that, um, there's a whole bunch of reasons why this is the case, but the most basic reason is this. What happens, what do our bodies do when they're injured? Shock. What's that? They hurt. Oh yeah, they do, but what else do they do? We go into shock. Well, sometimes, but what happens before that? Yes. Our body um, releases natural painkillers, right? Endorphins is an example. So you hear about runner's high. When people push themselves beyond a certain physical level, the body compensates by giving us an endorphin dump, right? Endorphin rush. And that can be highly reinforcing. And the reason that you'll sometimes, I mean, over the years, you know, we'll run into kids who will try cutting. And some of them are like, heck, no, I'm not doing that again. That hurts. And other kids who get it literally addicted to it. And they will chronically cut for years and years and years and years. And one of the differences, we believe, has to do with individual physiological differences that make some human beings more susceptible um, to the effects of those natural painkillers. So they are more at risk for sort of becoming addicted to it, while other kids are just like, that hurts, I'm not gonna do it. It's the same reason, like, if you, if you talk to people who exercise, there are some people who, they get that endorphin rush pretty easily during exercise, and it's super reinforcing. Uh, I have a friend who never gets it, never. Like, why would you ever exercise? If you don't feel better after, like, she just feels tired. Like, why would you ever exercise? So it's the same sort of thing. We know bodies are different, bodies respond different. Is there a correlation between people that are addicted to tattoos because they're painful. Right. Um, yes, there is. There is. Um, I mean, there are different reasons why people get tattoos, but yes, that is definitely a function of it. Because I've had very young adults now that they're getting tattoos all over, and they'll complain about how bad they have hurt. And I'm like, why are you getting them? But then pretty soon they start to crave that again. They go and they'll get another tattoo or another piercing, and that is definitely often at least within this same kind of family of, of endorphin stuff. Um, and so because of this, um, there are some basic reasons that we find students will tell us that they self-injure. Sometimes students will tell us they self-injure to feel something. So their normal state feels numb. And they, and they self-injure to get out of the numbness to feel something. This is particularly the case among kids who have experienced abuse. Again, not always, we can't make grand, grand sweeping statements, but I hear it a lot from those kids. Because they have gone into sort of a protective numbness um, in order to get by, and over time, they try to step out of it. And one of the most reliable ways they find sometimes is self-injury. Conversely, um, sometimes kids will say they feel too much and it builds up. So it builds up as anxiety or depression or stress or whatever, and they feel like a volcano about to erupt, and they cut to relieve the stress. So it bleeds off some of that emotion with the blood that they release. Um, kind of related but also subtly different is this idea that when you're under extreme emotional pain, and you're pretty concrete, and you don't have great coping strategies for dealing with something as elusive as emotional pain. If you can make that emotional pain physical, then it becomes more manageable. It becomes more controllable. And then I have, I have worked with kids who it's a punishment. It's a self-imposed punishment for guilt or feelings of worthlessness. It's a way, um, it's a way of punishing themselves for some imagined in. Sometimes it is a cry for help. Sometimes when you see kids who are showing their scars and you have a tendency to think, oh, that's just manipulation. They're just doing that for attention. Another possible possibility is that they have been unable to express or unable to get people to understand the extremity of the pain that they're in. And that is their way of just kind of crying out in a way that everybody can see. Student impact of this, um, again, it often indicates uh, significant emotional pain. Um, students who are dealing with that level of pain are gonna have difficulty concentrating, they're gonna have difficulty focusing. It has, the because of that, the usual educational impact. Students fall behind, they're not getting everything they could be getting from their education. 
obviously, uh, because of the things we've talked about, it also has a risk for harm. And kids cut at school. <laughs> kids will find broken bottles in the parking lot, or they will find bits and pieces of, they will cut with uh, paper clips, right? Um, so they will cut at school, and so they are, there is a risk of, of, of significant harm at school. And then social consequences. I mean, Anitra was talking about this kind of um, escalation that can occur because of a, a fad or a small group um, sort of escalation together. But the other side of it, too, is that these are very physically marking behaviors, and so the reverse can also be true, is that kids can be really stigmatized and ostracized because they're wearing, you know, the evidence of their emotional distress there for everybody to see. And so sometimes their pain's compounded then by bullying or teasing or, or whatever. How school staff can help. Um, there are some programs. Um, in specific schools, there are uh, good examples of, uh, of some programs in Canada, for example, where they have had such high levels of suicidal behavior and this non-suicidal self-injury that they have formed specific models and plans for how to address them. So the ACT model um, is one that you'll sometimes hear about in, in this literature, and it stands for Acknowledge, Care, and Tell. So this is the model that staff goes by and that they also try to teach to their students because I'm sure some of you have had students come to you who were not themselves cutters or not themselves self-injurers and they will say, I'm really worried about my friend, but I don't know what to do because she made me promise not to tell anybody, right? So they're walking around, even kids who don't cut, are walking around carrying this horrible secret and fearing that their friend is going to carry it too far, hurt themselves in some way, and they don't know what to do about it. So this model tries to, um, tries to set all of that aside by, by training everybody to acknowledge that it's happening, not ignore it, not pretend it's a manipulation, and if you ignore it, it'll go away, but acknowledge it, provide care and support, and tell somebody who can get um, the assistance that that student needs. Staff needs to be observant and aware. Um, it is, they, these aren't always obvious, but you'll see things that are. So um, what, if you don't see cutting, what will you sometimes see? Scars, the injuries, or the yeah, somebody's scarves, long sleeve shirts, long sleeve um, shirts, wet shirts when it's hotter, hoodies, big bang clusters and clusters of bangles or, or bracelets all the way up the arm, covering things like that. So it isn't always just the cutting that you see, but sometimes other indicators, and communicating those concerns to school counselors, um, encouraging peers and friends to notify parents if their friend is engaging in the behavior, notify a counselor. And not calling attention to signs of it in public. Again, it seems like it would be sort of intuitive not to do this, but it happens all the time. Where a teacher who has pretty good rapport with the kids and is a cool teacher will call a student out in public, in a classroom, on signs of self-injury. Which is a horrible idea. Um, and, and again, not dismissing the behavior as strictly attention-seeking is important. Self-injury questions. I'm glad to hear it's not as much of a problem in most of your schools right now. 